think I think to me it really the my first day out at Stanford um, was a huge turning point for me. I was 17 years old. I graduated a year early from high school, and in my mind, I was a pretty big deal. I was the top recruit in tennis in the country. I was um, also a top student, and and getting out to Stanford was an enormous wake up call because. Everyone was smart and had grades at least as good in SATs as I, as I did. And when I went out to the tennis courts, instead of figuring they'll give me the keys to the courts, I'm wondering, am I going to make this team? And it was really an eye opener in terms of the amount of commitment needed um, to sustain uh, quality tennis day to day and the kind of, of focus, determination, investment that all that I had done up until that point from two years old to 17 to be a top junior was now probably a larger jump to become a professional tennis player at the top of the game. And it was a really a gut check in terms of, am I willing to expend that kind of effort? Do, do you remember any specific in, instance where a coach, a brother, father, a fellow player took you aside when you were, a little bit down and frustrated and and gave you one of those pep talks and, and asked you how, how how deep you were willing to dig gene well i think i think it was my brother sandy um he's uh known to be very frank and so it was it was interesting that we had this practice session prior to going to a professional tournament and it was during my first year on the tour and I really played very badly my first year. And so we're driving back and he turns to me, goes, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I went, what do you mean? And he said, do you realize how much game you have and how much variety you're overdoing, overplaying, you're, you're, you're outthinking yourself. If you play the percentages and tone it down a little and, and work harder in the points and don't go so quickly for the elaborate, life will become very easy. No one is going to be able to beat you. And, and to me, it was like do less almost, but it was it was harder work in the points, but it was it was not taking the easy way out as I was taking and so that, to me, was a, a huge eye opener in terms of what it was to play really percentage tennis, uh, where you would win day in, day out when you're expected to get to the semis or better of every tournament every year. How do you put together that kind of consistency? I, I remember in Brad Gilbert's, Gilbert's book, Winning Ugly, uh, him talking about one time where he beat McEnroe. Maybe it was his first time of beating McEnroe. And McEnroe was so flummoxed at the end or during the match or at the end, I can't, can't remember right now, but McEnroe looked it up and he said something derogatory about Gilbert's game. And Gilbert inside, I think, was was laughing because he's beating McEnroe and he's he's got a, a strategy to do it and it's working. And there was nothing McEnroe could do. You know, this highly talented individual, great mind, great skill set. And now he's getting beat by a guy who's winning ugly. So I don't know if you remember that portion, but have you ever talked to Brad about those types of strategies? Well, Brad is, is you know, is a genius at himself, not having a lot of artillery, but using it very well and also getting um, players to be able to believe in themselves. So uh, when you think about John McEnroe and, Brad Gilbert, you almost think Brad Gilbert should be ball boying on talent, <laughs> you know, that he doesn't really even deserve to be on the same court. Um, but it's a vastly different thing when it comes to the ins and outs of match play and the kind of, of diligence and, and, and strategy and all that it takes, which is why you have to play the matches out and they don't just give John the trophy and say, Brad, you finished second. So it was really a tribute to the kind of thinker and competitor that Brad was. I um I saw a quote by Wayne Gretzky, uh, and it was, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And when I talk to people who are struggling, and most of us have struggled multiple times, and, uh, you know, they have that idea of living day by day, these types of things. And, and you know, if you don't get off of your couch, off of your desk, out of your car, get if you don't get out of your comfort zone 
and a friend of mine calls it circulating. He says, you got to get out and circulate. You're never going to be able to test the waters and fee- see where you you could be useful, see where you could fit in and see where you could eventually thrive. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Like Nick Boletari, I don't know how much he was thriving when he was in his teens and 20s, but he kept chipping away at it. And then he developed maybe the premier uh, school of, of both kinds, academics and tennis in the world. And it, I believe it's it, he's still uh, the man in charge. Is that your understanding? Uh, he's now actually quite ill and has backed off his responsibilities a bit. He still keeps quite a crazy schedule, but he's had a number of health issues that have that have sidelined him of oh. late. Jimmy he- Arias, his protege and also a contemporary of mine, has largely taken the reins now. Got it. Is is Jimmy Arias a college graduate, or did he did he leave college early? No, I don't. I'm not sure he's a high school graduate. He, you know, he started playing on the tour probably at 15 or 16. Was was he the the original powerful forehand uh, of the tennis circuit, or was there somebody else who who started doing more of the running around and blasting forehands? Well, there was there was Borg at the time also um, that was a little bit before. I think forehand dominance existed before, but he was the prototype for the voluntary forehand. Um, he was one of uh, Nick's original students, Brian Godfrey probably being the first of them. And uh, that was a lot of how how Nick crafted his, his coaching style uh, was, you know, Jimmy was somewhat of a template. 